So in this talk, I would like to clarify some misconceptions, misunderstandings, which accumulated through the time around the practice of inside meditation called Vipassana. So <laughs> what is the point? The confusion or, or misunderstandings, uh, some criticism also, arose because the Vipassana as a path of practice in, in Theravada Buddhism is incomplete. That it does not, uh, does not emphasize the practice of jhanic absorptions. If you go into the original suttas, the Buddha's discourses, you will see a lot of emphasis and support for deep absorptions called jhana, that it should be actually a direct component of the progress along the path. And if you go, if, if you see the Eightfold Noble Path, it ends up with sama samadhi, which means the four jhana, jhanic absorptions. So, not only in the original suttas, but even in the later forms of Buddhist practice, the jhanas are getting lots of support. It's highly recommended. And the Vipassana practice actually doesn't mention that. Even in some way uh, discourages the deep absorptions. You know, so this is, this is a criticism which has a substance, it, it has a reason, it is a quite serious things to consider. And those who are propagating the practice Vipassana are pointing to the Sutta, Susima Sutta, where the dry, dry insight is described and acknowledged by Buddha as well. So this is the opening situation. <laughs> now, to bring understanding into this discussion. I will go back at the beginning of 20th century when this practice, Vipassana meditations, is taking shape. You see, so Vipassana as it is understood, as it is practiced now, is not really very old. And if we go even back to the 18th, 19th century, perhaps even 17th century, I don't know exactly, the practice of intensive meditation in Theravada, wow, that, that's a clumsy story. Tantric practices, practices creeping into the Buddhist Theravadin practice of meditation. So some of the teachers noticed that that way of practicing is not really that what the Buddha originally taught. Seeing this discrepancy, they try to revive the original way or some practice which, which is founded in the original suttas. So this is the situation in Burma at the beginning of 20th century and the quite noticeable development also is in the lay community supporting the monasteries but also starting to practice meditation and starting to study the scriptures and some of the lay people even passing the Dhammacharya a spiritual or Buddhist examination. You know, so kind of a sl slight little competition about the competencies in the practice of the Buddhist path. Now, if we jump to the Second World War, Burma is still a British colony and there is even invasion or intrusion of the Japanese soldiers. But in the year 1959, the Burmese managed to kick out the the British kick out the Japanese and uh, sovereign Burma as a sovereign state uh, is standing on its shaky feet. There was lots of problems at the beginning. The first government did not succeed. The, the areas around the border were 
kind of fighting for independence. Oh, but the second government succeeded. Uno was the prime minister, and Ubakin was one of the chief ministers. You know, and these two names quite important to notice. These two great Buddhists, which they they wanted the best for for the country, for all the people in Burma, for all the people actually in the whole world. And so they choose the Buddhist teaching of peace and uh, liberation as the unifying power to introduce, you know, to, to unify the whole Burma under the Buddhist teaching. And Unu, as a prime minister, actually, he was a real megalomaniac. <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to spread the Buddhist teaching around the whole world. So with this, they started in the 50s to govern the country. Unu, for the monks, he organized the Sixth Buddhist Council, you know, great event for the Theravada Buddhist world. Uh, he invited the delegations from all the Theravadin countries, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Sri Lanka. He, even Venerable Jnana Tiloka and Jnana Pol Ponika were invited to represent the emerging Western Theravada Buddhism. And this council lasted at least two years, e even a little bit more. And as it was the tradition, uh, these councils were traditionally held in the caves. Now, Rangun had no cave, so Unu built one. <laughs> you know, this great, uh, great uh, spirit going over all difficulties. So. They built a kind of a huge rock, but inside it was a beautiful space for 2,500 monks. And traditionally there is a monk who gives the questions and there is a traditionally a highly educated senior, he gives the answers. You know, the controversies are clarified with this, with this method. And the monk who who was giving these questions in this huge audience of educated monks and so, was the young Mahasi Sayago. And the highly educated senior monks was uh, Mingun Sayago, Vichita Sara Bivamsa. You know, so just this, uh, this was the work for, from Unu for the monks. Now, what is even more important if in our talk, is that what these two great Buddhists, Unu and Ubaken, what they did for the Burmese people, for the, for the whole population. They wanted to uplift the practice of everybody. And not only to practice the dana and sila, they wanted even the lay people to realize the Sotapanna Magapala, to be the hairs of the Dhamma, to have the Dhamma in the pocket. Now, um, if you know what is the realization of Maga, there are four stages of realization in the Theravada Buddhism. Sotapanna actually is the lowest one, but in a way it's the most important one. I will explain it. The high, higher is the Sakadagami. Uh, the third, the Anagami, is already very, very high realization indeed. And Arahat, that, that's the full, full realization of the full Dhamma. The whole path ha, has been mastered. Um, that's the freedom already in this lifetime. Now, how to understand the lowest realization, Sotapanna, to be the most important? There is a great promise given by Buddha on many occasions. 
you know we have to we have to be quite clear that the original Theravada Buddhism is actually having this vision of samsara the vision of the endless circling going running around endlessly aimlessly in the rebirth after rebirth endlessly in samsara and of course the aim of buddha was to end up this meaningless running round connected with some happiness and also with lots of suffering especially in the lower lower rebirth majority of spiritual systems actually is aiming at at a good rebirth in samsara in the heavenly worlds or even in the god godlike worlds it is the buddha who is leading the practitioners out of the samsara into freedom of nibbana this is important to know what is the sotapanna promise given by buddha because who has successfully realized sotapanna realization the gate for the rebirth in the lower spheres of suffering is forever closed the sotapanna will be still continuing rebirth but maximum seven times going up um, the promise of the final liberation is already there so as i said the full realization is already in the pocket for sotapanna you know therefore uh, e even continuing the the worldly life and even some worldly rebirth is still uh, continues but you know the vision of the final liberation is secured therefore it is so important and these great buddhists unu and ubaken they wanted for everybody you know for everybody as possible to become sotapanna by practicing kind of a shortcut you know one monastic lineage created um, or designed this vipassana meditation as as it what was taught in mahasi meditation center that was one one style of vipassana ubakin was connected to different lineage of burmese monks Ledi Sayado, Webu Sayado. They, they devised, they, they designed a little bit different way of Vipassana, Vipassana, but with the same aim, in the shortest possible time to attain this Sotapanna realization, to have the Dhamma in the pocket. So now compare the monastic full way towards Arahatship with the shortcut vipassana meditation for it was designed for lay people mainly the vipassana practice was never meant to be the full path towards full realization no it was by definition a shortcut towards possible realization of the lowest realization you know it was never meant as a competition towards the monastic full way this is necessary to understand uh, now the consequences okay uh, the philosophy first first the philosophy ubakin retreats you know ubakin had had four chief disciples goenka was the well-known one ruth denison in america taught vipassana john coleman british spy also, I, I took a retreat with him in Switzerland. I took about two retreats with Goenka, one with John Coleman. Uh, Hoover, I think Hoover was the fourth one, but he did not really continue teaching. So Ubakin, uh, Ubakin philosophy was, you know, with the responsibility for the countries. Like people have no time to practice deep absorptions because jhanic absorptions that needs lots of time to 
to practice and very few people succeed actually in attaining absorptions. First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. You know, very deep purity of mind, very deep state of tranquility. This is good for the monks. Lay people have no time for this. And the government, Burmese government was responsible for the economy of Burma as well. Don't forget this. So this, this uh, type of practice was originally designed for lay people to spend intensive period of time in a very intensive practice and go back to the family, to the job, to keep the country going. This was the general philosophy behind the Vipassana. Uh, I remember actually uh, Goenkaji, he was very devoted, beautiful teacher. I have so much respect for Goenka. Uh, but he did not like monks in his retreats because it was not designed for the monks. Mahasi Sayadaw, he had a little bit different philosophy. As long the yogis, the, the practitioners, made progress in the intensive practice, you know, four hours sleeping, the whole day just sitting, walking, sitting one hour, walking one hour, alternating the whole day. That was so intensive. But as long the practitioner made progress along these jnanas, you know, the, the Mahasi system was following a very clear topography of jnanas, of insights. And the teachers were trained very precisely to see where the practitioner is practicing, how he, how he is progressing. And if there was no more progress, back the, the, the people were sent back to their jobs, to their families. This was the philosophy behind the Mahasi Sayadaw system. Um, I spent uh, more than four years in Burma. Actually, uh, the three years, more than three years, I was in the Mahasi training school. You know, first year practicing intensive meditation then in the school. So I know also a little bit the background from that. And uh, the teachers were, were quite uh, revealing interesting truth that the best meditation have the young girls from the university. They were sometimes attending the Mahasi Meditation Center by the whole classes, the whole semester was coming to practice meditation and they were doing very well. Many of them passing the ladder of the jnanas, of the insights towards the Magapala realization. The boys were doing a little bit less good. The middle-aged Burmese people well, yes, some, re some progress, yes, of course, but the monks, especially the senior monks, hopeless. That was the surprising reality. You know, these senior monks, lots of knowledge how, how it should be, you know, um, blocked by, by this expectation, what it should be, how it should be, Hopeless cases. The young monks actually they practice quite well. So uh, this was with the Burmese. With the Westerners, different. Again, the Western people so much rational thinking, logic thinking, questioning everything, devotion not very clear. So because of that, progressive, progressing slowly. And not many succeeded to get into the into the insights, and then progressing. You know, some of them passing also the maga. So the Western people needed longer, three months, f five months, of intensive, continuous practice. Now, I think you you have understood now that the vipassana was never meant to be some competitor to, towards the full full path. It was meant 
just as a shortcut. Now, the Vipassana practice actually is cultivating only three factors from the Eightfold Noble Path. Sama Vayama, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. Effort, lots of effort, mindfulness, lots of mindfulness and concentration, quite a deep concentration. Upachara Samadhi or Kanika Samadhi, which is already, you know, just before going into absorptions. Don't underestimate the depth of concentration the Vipassana needs, actually, to succeed. Now, because not the whole Eightfold Path is practiced, of course these Vipassana realizations are somehow quite shaky, imperfect. That's the deficit side of the Vipassana practice. It is not the harmonious progress, it is in a way out of balance. And the people who realized really some, the Sotapanna, you know, and in Mahasi, if there was enough time, they would even try to get the second path. But that was it. For Anagami, for the higher path, definitely the Janic absorptions are indispensable. That's, that's clear. And the Mahasi system never was aiming at these higher, higher realizations. Clear. So, uh, the, this Vipassana realization quite incomplete, coming back from perhaps practicing quite well, but coming back, pff, now the, the life as it is, so coarse, you know, this coming back into the raw reality for some people was quite a depressive, depressive time. Because if you practice the Eightfold Noble Path harmoniously in all, all areas, you also get the tools to cope with the imperfection of human life. Th this is a little bit the disadvantage of, of this practice. But, you know, if you consider the endless benefit of realizing Sotapanna, so you take it as a valid valid practice, even with this drawback. And actually, for, for many people, it's not, not really a big problem to come back. And, and they will practice in the daily life, you know, the, the normal life anyway is shaky and probably it will be shaky even after the practice, successful practice of Sotapanna, well, that these are the challenges of the life. You, you will be always pushed by suffering and kind of pulled by the beauty of, of realizations. Yeah, so it is. There is one more little chapter to touch, the Achantong practice. So Achantong uh, brought even further kind of uh, intensification into the process, not sleeping in the last days of the retreat. Well, yeah, that's an uh, intensification indeed. In the Mahasi, Progress of Insight, it was the Sankarupekanyana stage, just the last stage before enlightenment, where you really do not need to sleep. The mind is refreshed, it's detached already. You know, the Progress of Insight goes oh, through different areas and um, dark, dark insights, you know, to, to detach from... This, this goes very deep. Uh, you have to detach from the areas you have no access to in the mind. You know, the instincts. So the, the practice needs to address even areas of mind which are beyond our control. And these are sometimes difficult time in the practice. Dark insights. So the uh, practice of Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw, for example, was not really um, pushing the people into the next insight. The people have to come there by the intensive practice themselves. Achantong is using some clever and wise way of guiding the meditators into the next stage. You know, so the, still it is, it is the valid path for 
Well, yeah, you have to build up your own experience. And at least some of the meditators have benefited, greatly benefited, also by practicing the express vipassana by Achan Tong. But the more shaky, of course, this kind of uh, uh, quick developments, sometimes going with the uh, with the calendar, each day one one inside, you know, sixty stages of vipassana, you, you manage in two weeks, <laughs> because the final stages. This is just a one chitaviti, anuloma gotrabu maga pala pala. You know, it's just one moment, one mind moment. So actually, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Buddha would say even seven days, the shortest, the shortest. <laughs> yeah, some people got it even shorter in in one one session. You know, listening to Buddha's exposition of Dhamma, so strong. It was certainly also the influence, direct influence of the presence of enlightened Buddha, which worked you know, towards this intuitive opening. But, you know, um, to be honest, I am certainly not marginalizing this um, truth, general truth, that the spiritual realis realization globally, in all spiritual directions, the intensity is questions that in the Buddha's time, the, the realization was a clear cut. The, the realization was always experienced as a gr great relief, you know, because the negative karma was cut off by the Maga. You know, the teachers of all spiritual systems are actually discussing the intensity of the realization. Not all the kilesas, not all the things which are taking us down in our life. Not everything is purified. This is the reality, not only for Vipassana practitioners. In, in Burma, it was not easy to put this kind of questions to the main teachers. Uh, I didn't even try. But there were two teachers I had a deep trust. Shwe Omien Sayadu, the old one, the, the original one, you know, the, he was actually acknowledged Arahat. I had so much respect. I spent one vaso in his monastery before I came to Europe. And I dared to put this question to him. I formulated this, not to the Burmese people, but the, the Western people sometimes uh, passing even the Sotapanna Maga, and they don't show all the signs of change which this realization should generate or, you know, you should be free of, from certain unwholesome qualities. Each of the realization, you know, this is the definition, not that you get, you get something more to that what you have. No, no, no. You, you will be free of something which is actually the baggage, which is the drawback. You know, getting free of something. These are the signs of realization. And the Shwami in old Sayadom, he just, he said, not only the Western people have this kind of uh, unclarity, even the Burmese people. The, the, another honest one was the Pa'auk Sayadom. I met him in a hospital. He had a reoccurring malaria problems. So sometimes he was in Rangun in a hospital. I visited him there, I visited him once more. Beautiful, beautiful teacher as well. In his monastery, some of the monks, mostly monks, uh, realizing stages of, of uh, even the higher stages, I put him the same question. Do these people really show all the signs of freedom as it is in the scriptures? And he, he shook his head. Not really. Not all of them. You know, so this is the new, new situation we have to cope with. Never stop practicing. Even if you think you have something attained, 
don't rely on that. If there is any kind of remaining impurities, continue practice, continue practice. This is my advice. There was, I had the idea that Sotapanna being free of the heavy karma, which can take the rivers down. My idea was that even in the dreams, the Sotapanna cannot have a nightmare. You know, um, thinking that this is actually manifestation of some highly negative karma manifesting in dreams, presenting itself to the consciousness, causing the nightmares. So, yeah, there is some truth in that, because, for example, I was told that the Arahat has no dreams at all, the real one. So there is something in the manifestation of unresolved karma in dreams. But then I thought they may be also influences from outside, not really only personal karma in the dream, the consciousness, the mind is open perhaps even to the influences from another uh, dark beings may perhaps get access, present some horrible stage, but the Sotapanna will not react with fear and horror. Sotapanna would have the image of the horrible scenario or whatever, fearful fearful situation, but he would witness that as if you watch a bad program in a television. I am sure about this. You know, just, you know, what, what a Sotapanna, the lowest, lowest realization can mean for our life, that you will never fall into some shoreless despair, because there is no more ground for that. The heavy karma has been cut off. There are different kinds of practice. Find yourself what is, what is suitable for your stage of practice. You know, some people needs uh, are ready for a monastic way of practice and it is not always the only way. Many people in lay life made a considerable important progress. So feel inspired and practice in your own way. Use this life to bring light into your heart, to, to do something good for the whole humanity.